And we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the next chapter, which is chapter 3, the government intervention in the market. Basically, chapter 3 is about when there's a market failure, how government intervenes in the market. It's more like towards the planned economy system. We have to check why the government want to do the market. Although free market may work or may not work. The objective of this is you must understand the price for price link. Today, what we're going to cover is just price for price link. We'll leave taxation and subsidies next time. Depends also whether we can cover everything or not. We will need to know how to distinguish between the price wall and price ceiling. Right? So, like what I said just now, when there's a market failure, government will use different types of intervention. So, what are market failure? I will introduce a little bit later. There are a few types of government intervention. One is through regulations. Another one is through financial intervention. And the last one is through government provision. Government provision is something that we will not cover in our syllabus. So basically, government has no creativity. What do I mean by no creativity? Basically, when the government wants to intervene in the market, this is the market. They can only do two things, right? One is they control the price. Another one is to control quantity. In the price for price thing, what they did was they want to control the price. On the other hand, for taxes and subsidies, they are mostly controlling, trying to influence the quantity. That is the entire thing when the government wants to intervene in the market. Right? There are many market failures, however, market failures is not actually covered in our syllabus. It requires another hour or another two hours or three hours just to cover market failure. I will just brief you on what is market failure. There are many types of market failure in the world. Market failure simply means that when the free market system doesn't work, as it should, then the government will try to intervene the market to influence the market so that it try to adjust back to the normal market situation. First of all is merit and demerit goods. Merit is something good for you, but you don't know. Demerit goods is something that's not good for you, but you don't know. Merit goods are more like education, right? We all know that merit. It is good for us, but we don't know maybe how much should we consume. And same for demerit goods. Demerit goods are like cigarettes. We all know that it may be harmful, but we don't know how harmful is it. So something regarding what we don't know that will make the difference and influence the quantity that they should be. Second one is public and quasi-public goods. Public and quasi-public goods is covered a little bit on some additional slides in my chapter one. Public simply includes two characteristics. One is non-excludable, one is non-rivalry. Non-excludable means that I cannot exclude someone from using the goods. Non-rivalry just simply means that it is not subjected to scarcity. Because of that, they are considered public goods. Then you cannot charge them for it. Quasi public is just partial public goods that we will not cover as well. The third thing is information failure. Due to information failure, government may want to intervene the market as well. Information failure is like either, not either, there are just three types of information failure. First one, you have no info. Second thing, you have partial info. Third thing, you have wrong info. Regardless of which, information failure, the ultimate outcome is you make a wrong decision. That's why government want to intervene in the market, right? So one example for information failure is, in fact, actually information is a huge topic. There's one subject known as information economics that help us to allocate our resources more efficiently. So the example that I want to raise just now is like, the LED lights in the car parks that show vacant or not vacant, 
Previously, before the LED lights, we have to go through many rounds before we find car park because we don't know is there any vacant car park in the shopping mall. However, after this increasing in information using just the light bulb, the LED lights, we now know that, okay, this row, the car park is full, we don't need to spend extra fuel, we don't need to spend extra time going through all these car parks. So this increased the efficiency as well. And government would like to intervene that if they have a failure. Number four is ever solution of Morazer is more like a derived form of information failure. Ever solution is just like when we want to choose something, we end up keep on choosing the wrong thing because we don't have enough information. And Morazer is more towards that we tend to actually employ someone that when we monitor them, they act very good, but when we don't monitor them, which means we don't have the info about them, then they start to have some different type of attitude. This is for labor market, it's, it can also be used for the insurance market and other few more types of markets. The next one would be externalities. More importantly, in externalities, they will also have positive and negative. Positive externalities is something that is good for the economy, but not in terms of goods. Like it will have a spillover benefit. Negative externalities is something that is not good for the economy. They have a spillover negative effects to others. So they are known as externalities. The last part is something that we're going to cover. It is known as the monopolistic elements. The distribution of income and wealth it will be covered in macroeconomics. So monopolistic elements is something in chapter 5. There are four types of market structures. Now, going back to press public, due to all these market failures, government may want to intervene in the market. One student quoted before, economics is like the opposite of everything. The science of opposite of everything. I found that this is quite a nice quote, right? So I use his quote. Because in economics, price floor actually refers not to the floor, but on top. It's not something on bottom. Right? This is a typical price floor for a labor market. You can see that there's a labor here, right? And there's a market here, demand and supply. The only difference is now we want to put a law, legislation, a regulation, right? Regulation means what? Regardless of you are the supplier or producer, you will have to follow this law. I would like to use labor market because I would like to I would like all of you to think about currently you are a labor and you are actually a supplier. The firms who want to hire labor, they are now the consumer, they consume the labor service. I would like you to think out of box, change the perspective. Right. Of course, obviously I can use other products, but other products will not let you think from a different perspective. Right? Oddly enough, many students, many of one that I already shared with, they always got mistakes on this part. They always feel that labor should be a consumer, so they put labor in labor demand. Right? Firms should be a supplier. So they put, they use supply for firms. In fact, it's inverse, right? Similar to price floor, price floor is actually above, you can see, above what? It's actually above the equivalent price, right? Above equivalent price. Minimum price, is used to protect the producers. So in this labor market is to protect the labor, right? 
why the government want to protect them? Because government may feel that the wage is too low. For example, in Malaysia, a normal part timer will fetch around just seven ringgit per hour. Right, this is pretty low because we cannot even buy a McDonald's set if we want to. So this is quite sad. In other countries, when they work one hour, they can buy two sets of McDonald's, for example. So government may feel that it's necessary to intervene in the market because the free market doesn't work. The labor is paid too low. The government, out of the moral grounds, as you can see here, they would like to impose a minimum price. So, maybe they would like to impose a 15 hour, 15 ringgit per hour. So now we can see that why the price flow should be above, not below. If the price flow is below, it is known as the non binding, like 5 ringgit per hour. Nobody cares, right? The labor still wants 7 ringgit per hour. The producers are also willing to buy the labor. Remember, it's a demand to demand for the labor as a ringgit per hour. So this is non binding, this is useless. So minimum price or price floor have to be above 15 ringgit per hour. Right? Remember to also draw inside the work manual for this market. Right? I guess show you how to sketch it. So basically you just PQ, just the market, demand supply, and depends on what is your example, you can use other examples. So what you need is actually another line. This should be a solid line because it's a regulation and it assists, right? Put here price minimum or price floor. What you see here, the dotted line that is touching the supply curve is the quantity supplied. While the dotted line that's touching the demand curve is known as quantity demanded. So you have to draw this. If you have any comments, do type in the YouTube. Once you've done this, you'll find that there's a problem because the market is not in equilibrium. The quantity supply is actually greater than quantity demand. This is what we call the surpluses, right? Surpluses. So it's not only for it's not only used for low scale worker wage. It's also used for demerits if the government doesn't want too much of the goods that's harmful, right? And it's also used to reduce the competition by imposing them on the imports. This one will be covered actually in macro. So there are always two effects. Once the government imposes transfer. The direct effect will be surpluses, as you can see here. The quantity supply is greater than quantity demanded. There will be this surpluses. And this is how do I write when it comes to direct effect. Normally, I will ask the examiner I'll ask the reader, the what, those who watch this video, to look back at the diagram, the diagram that I just drew, right? It is up to you whether you want to put P and QE. I put P and QE here because I want to explain as well the P and QE. However, it's up to your writing style. So government feel that the wage is too low for workers. When the government feels that the wage is too low for workers, the government wants to help them, so they impose a minimum price. 
After the minimum price, one of the effects is the wage become higher, right? So normal labor, they will now have high income. However, it creates another problem. It can be seen that. <coughs> Excuse me. It can be seen that. Now it creates another problem. The QS is greater than QD. This means that the quantity of workers who are willing to supply is more than the firms that are willing to demand. Why this will occur? This basically will occur because now the minimum wage is more expensive. So some employers, they might want to do the dishwashing themselves. They might want to take order from if they are in a restaurant setting. Right? They might want to do, take the order themselves so that they can save some cost of labor. Right? So the quantity demanded actually drop when the minimum wage is higher than the equivalent price. At the same time, if you are labor, initially your wage is low. That's why you are not going to work or you don't want to look for a part-time job. You may prefer to binge watch Squid Game, the red carpet. You may want to binge watch. All of us are young. Is that that drama? I can't remember, but... Right. So something like that. But when the minimum wage is high enough to incentivize you to work, you may want to go and look for a job. So there will be more and more individuals that want to look for a job or a part-time job. This leads to the quantity supply more. As a result, the quantity supply is greater than quantity demanded, leading to surpluses. This is the direct effect. Right. However, I told you before, there will always be indirect effect. Indirect effect is something that requires critical thinking, and you need to actually think what are some things that you can see directly from the diagram. First thing you will see is it will lead to inefficiency from suppliers. Right. If this were to be a labor market, the workers will not work as hard. They will tend to be lazy, they will tend to be slack. Because they are already guaranteed wage, you no longer pay a worker based on their performance. You are paying them based on the law. How many of you actually will work harder if the law already stated how much that uh, that you should get that you should be paid right type in the comments below i want everyone of you to type this is one of the questions that i asked throughout the youtube for those who never type you will know time will tell Right. Second effect is it will lead to underground market. Some employers may not want to wash the dishes, may not want to take order because of the face problem, for example. However, they are not willing to pay the minimum wage. So what they do? Maybe they would like to pay it a little bit higher than the, than the equivalent price. Maybe higher here. But not as much as the minimum. So this creates the underground market. Underground market will exist. That's why you can see there are many, many illegal workers in Malaysia. Why there is why why there are so many? First of all, because the minimum wage is high. Second, they are more hardworking. They have the right attitude. Right, they don't watch YouTube so much. They don't binge watch. They don't give excuses. Right, for not doing work. 
just like some of you here, they will not give late excuses that like for not coming to work, they will not have traffic jam issues, they will not have car accident issues, right? So there, there are so many advantages. That's why there's this market assisting, right? And this is underground market because it's illegal. It's another indirect effect that you should take note. If we were to give government a solution, government is always creating something that leads to more problems. That's why government is always there, right? They think that more they think that low wage is a problem. So they create price flow. But once they create price flow, they lead to more inefficiency, then they have to ask economists to create a new solution for the price flow. Right? To solve the surplus problem. There are two ways. One is to encourage demand, another one is to discourage supply. So let me just show you what do I mean by that. So this is a price floor on top or minimum wage, minimum price. You can see that initially it leads to quantity supply is greater than quantity demanded. Right. So, first thing is to encourage demand. Encourage demand means a reverse of encourage demand or discourage supply is meant to close the gap. Encourage demand simply means they want to try to shift the demand curve until there's no more surplus. Right. Similar to discourage supply. Discourage supply it just means that they would like to. Decrease the supply under the close gap, which will work. Now, let's talk about encourage demand. First thing will be buying up the surplus. You may be wondering, in the labor market, how do I buy up the labor? Does it even make sense? What do you think? Do type in the comments below and let me know. Right? Type in the comments. This will be part of the attendance. Right? I'll wait for a few seconds. So how? Do I go and ask the others unemployed workers? Hey! How much are you? I, should, I want to buy you. What is this? Is this a what? Prostitution market? No. I just want to buy you. Are you recruiting me as gangster? No. I just want to buy you. Doesn't, doesn't make sense. Does it make sense? No. Doesn't make sense. So, what do I mean by buying out surplus? Of course, in terms of other products, it's just simply just buying. That's all. Right. For labor market is different. Your explanation, explanation need to be a little bit different, right? What do I mean by that? Maybe the government can hire them as government staff, government employees, right? Create another department, just like what your government do. Always create more and more departments to hire more and more. How many of you know that actually in Malaysia, the government departments is more than many developed countries, right? Type in one in the YouTube comments if you know. Type in two if you don't know. Type in three if you never even watch until here. Uh, just, just a joke. Right. So, this is by hiring them as government servants. The second thing is doing advertisement. As most of you may or may not know, advertisement will usually increase the demand from D to D1. Right? It's to create brand awareness, creating... Depends on your product, right? Labor. As for labor, how do we, how do we, how do we advertise on labor? 
any idea. I feel like calling names, but I want to make it as general as possible. So I'm not going to call names, right? You type in the comments before in YouTube, right? It is to advertise using labor or local labor script. They are very hardworking, right? They never late. They never late for work. They never use their phone. They never swipe their phones, touch their phone at all. They don't give excuses. They work very hard, right? They're not afraid of dirty, right? They're very, they're very efficient. They're knowledgeable, right? They don't mind you paying them lower salary. Yeah, right. But this is how they should, like, if they want to use advertisement for the labor market. Mostly for other products, it will just be like advertising the product, right? The last one being to decrease substitutes. How do we decrease substitutes? What is the substitute for local? It is foreign. Does it make sense? If it's foreign worker, how can we reduce foreign workers? Do we kill them? Kill all the illegal? Yeah, kill, kill, kill. No. We reduce the visas that we issue to the foreign workers if they are legal and we catch them and send them back using the immigrant like immigration department. We can actually reduce the numbers of foreign workers so that the restaurants owners, the firms have no choice but to hire the local. Right. This will increase the demand for the local products or labor market. In contrast, if we want to decrease supply, one of the way is to introduce quota system. Right. Introducing quotas light. One labor can only work two hours a day, right? Or how many hours per week? If they exceed the quota, they will have to end up in prison or they will get a fine so all these are considered quotas right again limiting the numbers by doing increase demand and discourage supply it will actually lead to the close of the super scan hence the government successfully close the gap of surplus and at the same time they can help the labor market All right and that is for price flow right if you have any question remember to type in below and let me know I'll shoot another recording for price ceiling.